And here are Mr. Jordan Allen himself. How are you doing, my friend? How's training going? Oh, good, man. All good. All good. Thank you. So you're getting the miles in as well. Is running quite a usual part of your like routine and stuff? Is it something you, I don't know, have always sort of stuck with? Well, for about a year straight, yeah, to be honest, it, it kind of started when COVID happened because it's just like the easiest way to get some cardio in, really. And then from there, it's just stuck, really. I mean, this is an interesting thing. People sort of jumped in and sort of left as well. I left it as well. It used to be 5Ks every other day. Now I can't be fucked with it, but that's another conversation for another time. But when you're doing your like longer runs and stuff, is it a bit of a, is it a time thing you're going for? Is it an intensity? Is it just general like getting it done? What What is the 10Ks and stuff like to you? Well, my 10K run, I try and push for under 50 minutes as like a, a benchmark. And my two mile runs, I push for under 14 minutes. So I do, I, just, I do push for time, but it's pretty reachable for me at the minute. So like 50 minutes, I'll do that easy. And 14 minutes in the two mile, I'll do it easy. So it's not too difficult, to be honest. When you're uh, that's sorry, let you finish, mate. Go. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm just going to say that's like how I've started doing it. Because before I was just getting out and doing it. And now I've just kind of put the benchmark there and I'll just hit it every time, so... Well, it's a huge thing to start progressing as well because a lot of people take things very passively. They're like, okay, I just do it. I'll get better at some point. Whereas you're making more of a point of, okay, here's a target and let's keep on like reaching and reaching, pushing that sort of thing. It's always good. And when you're on those runs, are you listening to music? Are you in your own thoughts? Are you podcasting? How are you mentally-wise when you're doing it? I'm literally just focusing on my breath, to be honest. I'm just working with the breath and just keeping my breathing at a steady rate, same pace, breath all the way through and then... That's it. I'm just focusing on the breath and just living in the moment and just cracking on with the run. I mean, that's always good as well. I mean, when you're um training as well, like obviously not the minute because it's a bit restricted and everything's all a bit all over the place. But when you were yeah. training, like, what was your cardio like before doing these runs? Is it something you found made much of a difference? Is it something more of a mental cue? What has that, I don't know, correlation been like? No, to be honest, to my cardio at the minute, just I would say from running mainly, it's unreal to be honest. Like it's best it's ever been. And I do put that all down to running. I do. Definitely. I mean, this is something people seem to swear by just generally as well. Because again, they get the the wear and tear side, but also the dividends of also the, the gas tank expanding. It's a bit of a draw the knife somewhere. Like, how do you find 10K for you regards to wear and tear? Do you find you quite sore afterwards? Do you find much grinding, much issues? Or is it just enough, that sort of sweet spot? It's just right because... But like, like I say, in the first lockdown, I was running every day, like every day or every other day, like four or five times a week. And after two, three weeks, really, I just felt it straight away. And I thought, right, I better cut back, do it sensibly because it's something I want to do long term throughout my entire fighting career rather than just something I want to do to fill in the time because I've realised it's definitely a useful tool to put there. So that's, I guess, an interesting sort of segue there. So with back to usual... So I'm going to go fast forward back to reality. So back to training full time, everything else, MMA, all the sessions. In those weeks of training, where does running fit in then? Is it going to be once a week a long run? Is it going to be a couple of like mid mid distance runs to sort of see you on? What is the preference when thinking back to normal? Well, I've already well my training routine. I'm very strict on the routine. Like I actually get frustrated with myself if uh, I'm a bit late for something or. I've planned something and like, I just can't do it through something outside of my control. I actually get quite frustrated. So I've already thought about that myself. And when gyms are open, I'll definitely still get them two runs in because the 10K I do every Sunday, which is no problem. That's like my thing. And the two mile, it's only 15 minute work. I can do it before training. I can do it after training. It won't kill me too much as long as I do a bit of stretching before and after I find them all right. I mean, that's important. You can also sort of manage and also manage your expectations because this is sort of, you need to remember what you signed up for. Like, unless you want to start yeah, cross country running, yeah, like, you need to remember what you want to get good at. It's all the time you need to put in everything else. Now, when you are back in the gym as usual, is strength and conditioning something that's a priority for you? Is it something you do just because you have to? Is it neglected entirely? Where does strength and conditioning and this sort of stuff fit into your, I don't know, usual priorities? Well, I try and do it two, three times a week, but I think that's mainly just because. I've got the equipment at home, which I've been, I'm very lucky to have been gifted by my friends and my girlfriend's family. I'm very lucky to have them. And since I've had them, it's just something that I've kind of done because it is necessary. Mm. But I'm a strong believer of it's got to be sport-based. So just doing bicep curls and stuff, for example, I don't see the need of it to be an MMA fighter. So I just try and well, do we all, dis- we all disagree a little bit. Don't worry about that. That's it's it. Get, get those disco <laughs> muscles out, innit? 
<laughs> definitely, I, I, I still do them, mate. Don't get it wrong. I still, when, I, when I look at the way it's a finished the session, I'll just be like, yeah, come on, I'll do a few. Just, you've got to, you? It's rude not to. It's rude not to. Everyone yeah, knows that. that's what I mean. You've got, you've got to do them disco muscles, mate. You've got to, but. As a whole, it's not something I, I, I focus, don't focus on it too much. It's more just passively like, oh, go on, I'll do three sets of girls. Wing, wing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Come on. Oh, you're there as well. <laughs> There's 21 just banging them out and saying, yeah, this is fight yeah, camp. 21, that's it. That's the one. <laughs> that's bang, it, bang, fight camp. Nah. <laughs> love to see it. Love to see it. And the reason I ask this sort of thing, outside of the usual cliche questions of, you know, how did you get into that sort of stuff? I found my priority for strength conditioning out of a, a deficit of it as such, being a bit skinnier, a bit weaker, getting gas, that sort of stuff. So then I've prioritised that. With your training and what you've added in, what you've taken away, has it been to build on what you've already got? Is it to replace what you need? What has been the purpose behind the things you've added in so far, like the running, for example? It's literally just to make me the best all-round fighter that I can be. Strong enough, fit enough, technique just right. I want everything just to be perfect balance. I don't want to be too good at one thing and not a good enough over. I believe you've got to have a perfect balance of it all, definitely. So with that being said, then, do you do any specific discipline work then and sort of balance each other out? Or is it just a case of collective MMA and try and keep everything on the same kind of level? To be honest, I kind of look at things separately. So when I'm running, I don't actually think about MMA. I think I'm on a run. And when I'm doing rolling, I kind of tie it in afterwards. I think about the things that I've done and think, yeah, that would work if I were against cage or if I were taking a few strikes, maybe I'd do that. But generally speaking, I look at it all separately and bring it together as a one product if you know what I mean because mm. this is always that weird sort of I don't know melting point when you're trying to roll but also have MMA in mind but if you're not throwing the strikes you can't do it the same way like you're just sat yeah. for this part of five minutes doing nothing like yeah, yeah safe, but it's not really the point it's not really the idea I yeah exactly <laughs> that, that's that like, I'm a bit sometimes when I'm rolling like not really not really recently more in the past when I've been rolling, I kind of sit on the bottom and just think, right, we'll have a minute. When that that will never ever happen in the real life context never. in an MMA fight ever. So it's good. It's good to differentiate between the times when you kind of can say to yourself, or oh, I'm just going to crack on, have two minutes here, and think about it, and the times when you think, right, I've got to move. It's well, good then- to differentiate between. I think there's a place for both, but you've got to differentiate definitely. That's that's so right for some reason. Again, it's the urgency you're fighting, like. Especially a rolling, like you said there, give yourself a minute. Oh, I'll eventually get up. Said, no, 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 no. The floor is lava. Every time your back's on that mat, you're losing. Until you get a sub, exactly. losing, and it's a bad. Exactly. You see a lot of jujitsu guys think, okay, I'm, I'm a jujitsu guy. I'm fine. I get my guard. I've won this fight. He said, not yet. You haven't. So you get the, get the tap. You get one shit, and it's a very tricky habit to sort of build. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, with your training in itself, and how do you guys like to do it? Because you're, you was tap or snap. Now you're resurrection, isn't it? Yeah, resurrection, yeah. So what's the general format for that then? Is it broken down into like MMA striking, MMA grappling? Is it just collective MMA class, still open sparring? How do you guys like to do it over your place? Well, the last timetable, I'm not sure if it's going to change when we go back, but the last timetable that we so, uh, we had the fitness classes and the intermediate MMA classes and the advanced MMA classes. And then we had like specific days for striking, so like MMA striking, MMA fitness. And we'd... It's a bit of everything, really. So you've got the MMA classes where you kind of come in, sometimes even say, what do you guys want to do? Like, is there anything you guys want to particularly work on? And I also think it's definitely better to have the intermediate class and then the advanced classes because you can... There's some things that you couldn't work on in the intermediate class and some things would be pointless working on in an advanced class, if you know what I mean. So give me an example of a difference between the classes. <laughs> Excuse me, it's not Ryan. I've got a biscuit in my throat. Um, no, it's fine. <laughs> it'll end Jammy, Do- <laughs> Jammy Dodge is yeah. you know, tickling a little bit. But yeah, more so because where I think one of my old places used to do it, it was beginners was a technique and a sequence, whereas advanced was the same technique but from different like ideas on it, how you could finish it in different ways, different follow-ups, and that sort of was more, here is one thing and here's like different ways you can go from there, whereas the beginners is, okay, here's the whole stem as like a very loose, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, what's so, yeah, that, that, that's that's I'd pretty much say that's yeah. I wouldn't say yeah, that yeah, that's pretty much it. I'd say I would say that for sure. Yeah. What's the levels like in the classes as such? Obviously, they're sort of specified as beginners, intermediate, and advanced. Do you get much much crossover in that sense? Do you get an advanced guys in the beginner classes? Do you get much beginners in the advanced? Is it more done by the their knowledge? Is it done by their com- competition level? How do they distinguish who's who? As such. To be honest. 
I'm not too I'm not too sure how they distinguish it on the general scale, but like me personally, I got put I've I've not I've got put in advanced class again just before COVID. I got kind of budged up, but I don't think that was because of my skill level. I think it was just because of my commitment level. Because they could see that I was just doing doing things that never needed to be done, if you know mm-hmm. what I mean. So it's like, okay, like he definitely wants to do it, so we'll bring him up. That's like my experience. But I do think it's a bit of everything, a bit of your attitude, a bit of your commitment, a bit of your just what you want from it, really. Because sometimes in the beginners classes, you obviously get them guys, they'll come for a week, two weeks, three weeks. You'll not see them again for a month or two and they'll come back, which is obviously fine. We've all got lives, we've all got commitments. But the advanced class, you don't tend to see that at all, really. I mean, people have a day off, obviously, we've all yeah, got yeah. lives, everything happens, but you don't tend to see that long-term out of the gym sort of thing. Yeah, you don't see a lot of hot and cold with beginners. You see them sort of really keen, they love it, then they sort of get a bit bored or a bit of a plateau and think, yeah, fuck this. Yeah. Whereas you see the consistent definitely. guys, I take a couple of days off if that, but they're pretty regular. But Yeah, definitely. For everyone listening as well, there's, there's no right or wrong as such, but it depends on what you want to do. If you want to compete yeah. professionally, you can't, slack for that amount of time you're going to be so far behind you won't be able to catch up whereas if you want to be you know whenever you want for fun only go when it's fun why would you if you're going for fun why would you go when it's not fun if you exactly want, for drugs, <laughs> you're paying for it you're Definitely. Adult, show up when you want to show it's up. not forced <laughs> it's not forced you've got to enjoy it even even at the levels that i would like to get at like the high levels world-class levels like even at them levels you've got that if you know what i mean like you've got people who they just think, oh, I'm just going to go for a roll for fun today. And you can differentiate between when you're doing it to work and get that real knowledge and grinding and when you're just doing it because it's just fun. And we all have them times where you're just rolling, just messing about. You just throw, you know, there's no technique, you're tired or whatever. You just finish the hard session and just have them few fun rolls. And that's always fun as well. But if you take it too seriously to the point where you start to, like, I don't know, like, take it too seriously to the point where you start to frustrate yourself and think oh I'm no good at this I can't do this uh, these are way better than me like you've got to just take a step back and think you know what this is fun man I, I'm enjoying this is me like I love this and then it'll come in future the the want and the urge the, the urgency to want to improve quickly and get up there like it'll come in time but you've got to start off having fun or even just walk into the gym and say I'll just try it like you've got to start off and have it fun in mind. The best thing and the worst thing about MMA, Jiu-Jitsu, and always martial arts is there'll always be someone better than you and there'll always be someone worse than you. And it's always. a very bitter pill to swallow sometimes. And it's a very sweet one at the same time. Like you can have the same round where you're like absolutely manhandling someone like they've never done anything before. And then the next round, within minutes, you are on the uh, complete polar opposite end. You're getting squished yeah. like you've never trained before, like you don't know anything. Like yeah. <laughs> it is horrible. It is ego shattering and any sort of I don't know, confidence you're expecting to build from that. I don't know where it is, but at least you know what you know. You know exactly, okay, this is where I yeah, sit. Yeah, exactly. In order. Okay. Kind of finishing, you kind of finish and go, um, well, forget about that one. Next. <laughs> it's certainly um, something you have to you learn to manage as well. I mean, this is part of the battle in itself. Like, everyone's got an ego to some extent, but it's not getting rid of it, it's managing it. Like, if you didn't have yeah. any form of ego, you would let everyone beat you and you wouldn't care. Yeah. Why would you exactly. do that? Yeah. Why would you yeah. do that? I've, I've always said, to some degree and levels, this game especially, you've got to have an ego. You've got to look at yourself and think, you know what, I am a fighter and, I, and, and I'm good at what I do. And then you're going to get, get on mat and then someone's going to make it look like a complete little bitch. Mm. <laughs> and you're going to think, right, I'm not as good as I thought I was, but I'm still happy. And that's how you've got to be. But this, sure. is, this is a huge thing and it gets so misinterpreted as sort of, you know, you're an arsehole because you're an ego. No, 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 no. I'm setting a higher standard for myself than I'm currently producing. That's what that is. And that yeah, is the like same that. mentality yeah. that's gotten me out of situations where I would have given up before and I would have accepted, okay, I'm out. I'm caught in this triangle. I'm done. I said, no, composure, maybe a bit of explosion every now and then. But, you know, I look, I'm out of it. What a surprise. And again, it's that little bit extra that gets you a bit further. It's not so much... I'm the big guy. I'm going to go sparring tonight and beat all the pros up. No, no, no. I'm just going to get hurt. <laughs> Fuck that noise. Yeah, but, you know, exactly. I, I, I'm just going to have fun <laughs> I say I'm going to commit to what I'm going to do and I'm going to you know I'm not going to count myself out already now in regards to your mindset when it comes to training in general is do you have a like I don't know set purpose for each session as such is it just business as usual and trying to enjoy it whilst you're there is it particular goals how, how do you have to manage your session so you've got I've advanced and made tonight what is your goal going into that session have you got a certain technique you want to hit is it certain partners you want to spar with is it certain results that you score in your rounds like what is your general mindset going into a normal training session well 
well, at Resurrection, so if you're in the advanced class, I've seen that you did the podcast with Jake Stark, mm. great man, top man, obviously he trains there. He he really is at the gym, is 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 there. You know what I mean? He's is one of the top dogs when it comes to the training partners and stuff. So I always like to get around him with him, regardless. There's plenty, there's many other good lads there. You've got Corey Harris, Bart, Dorian. I'm sure you know there's plenty. Yeah, keep going, yeah. And uh Jake really he's 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 just technical, just so technical and like He's a true martial artist. I said to him once, I says, uh, you know you, man, he says, who? I says, GSP. And he laughed and I said, no, really, because you're a true martial artist. If you're like, do you know what I mean? Like mm. every every single little thing he does, he thinks about it and he thinks, right, how can I do this? Can I do that? It's very technical. And I always, every session, I always like to get, even just to talk to him a bit and pick his brain because the way he thinks about it is, is it's way different to our, uh, and a lot of people think about it. He's just got that uniqueness to the training side of it. And especially the grappling side of it is very technical. And that's what I like about it. So I always try and pick his brain. And as far as like, do I want to do this or do this technique? Like, I kind of just go see what we're doing. And if, if we're doing like three different techniques, I'll kind of pick one and say, that's the most likely what's going to happen in a fight. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and work on that one, ask questions, ask a bit more and just figure it out a bit. But generally, I'll just turn up and want to try my hardest and just, be not be knackered when I go home. I don't want to leave and be like, right, I want to go run now and leave and be like, that were hard. <laughs> I mean, it's good to have those sort of sparring partners where you get that happy medium of also like getting pushed, but also learning. Yeah. But again, someone who appreciates the technical development side of it. The reason why that is as important as I'm making this out to be, because this is everything. Like yeah, as much definitely. as it's being fighters and everything else, you want to improve. You want to do something better. But on top of that, it's not accepting the standard you're at now. Because again, if you're in a gym where... Jake's your ceiling, for example, and then he just sort of gets get comfy and he's fine. Whereas you're still chasing that, your ceiling then gets higher. But if you settle yeah. with the feeling you had, with okay, these techniques work on someone who's not applying anything differently. You need to keep on, you need to generate that sort of fire as such. And the fact Jake is constantly trying to understand why things aren't working and problem solving, exactly, that, that's it. It makes your ceiling higher. So again, yeah, it's kind definitely. of like you're chasing him up and he's chasing himself. But again, obviously it's competitive, it's all fun and everything else. But it's oh more, yeah, it's friendly you know, progression, isn't it? Mm. And this is and really like that. Sorry, mate, go on. There's a bit of a delay there. You go. I, I, no, you're right. I was just going to say, at resurrection, especially in the advanced group since I've been, it really is like we're all just trying to push each other that step further. And I, I, I really like that. I really do like that. That is what you need in a team because, it, like I say, if one person's complacent. Another person can play another one. But end of it, you're only going to have one person. What's actually training, and mm -hmm. at that gym then, especially in an advanced group, it's that's that's the level to it. We're all pushing each other. If someone's having a bad day, we're all going to work it, work him extra hard, so that next time we're having a bad day, do that to us. And that that's kind of how I do things. I like that. You've got to have that chasing each other up, up, up. And then when you're at the top, you can look at each other and say, "Look, it worked." <laughs> that camaraderie is so important, especially because it's one of those ones. If you're doing a PT on your own, you're fucking dying, it's horrible. Whereas if you're in a class, you're like, okay, we're all in the same boat, okay. I'll keep an eye on the fat one, see if he gasses first, see if I can you know, get arrested for that. But <laughs> I didn't say that out loud, that's fine. But you know what I mean? <laughs> 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 like he's done nine burpees, he said 15, but that's fine, we'll crack on. I can slap. That's it, that's all right. <laughs> no one said that, that's fine, that's cool. We don't body shame it, we're all good, we're all good fun. <laughs> but this is, this is the thing about being proactive and such, and this is finding those happy mediums. And this is, back to the point initially about egos and managing that because if you find a competitive pace against people who you can be and beat you and also like back and forth like prime example some beginner catches you in a bit of a guillotine when you're going for a lazy double what happens there are you going to sit there and accept it because it's a bit tight or are you going to think he's not tapping me because i'm better than him i'm not going to accept that i'm not going to hurt him but i'm going to get out of this and that's the difference it's finding that kind of okay my ears are pricked up now. I'm going to crack on. It's not going to be, I'm going to hurt someone, but it's like, okay, that's not, I can't run. You're well, I, bet, I, better, I better wake up now. It's like, wow, okay. <laughs> better that's wake up. But this is where you find that happy medium. This is how you can sort of apply that competitive pressure without anyone getting hurt and no one's, you know, getting injured. And now the same thing. <laughs> if you've you got a concussion, you're not injured. You just got a concussion and it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> you can still train, but I wouldn't advise anything. <laughs> um, regards of your development in general, then outside of the cage, so obviously outside of training and all this, you've done your SNC, you've got your technical work. Regards of like mental side of things, are you reading certain things to do with competition? Are you watching certain things? Are you watching documentaries? Are you watching fights? Are you switch just switching off full stop. What's your 
time away from training look like? Well, to be quite honest, in, in my, my to be quite honest, my personal like life outside of work is training. Like that, that to me is everything. Obviously, I balance it out with friends, family, my girlfriend. I, I balance it all out, but my entire life, to be honest, revolves around training, and it has done for a, over a year now. To be honest, and it's not very, it's not a very good year to be putting your basis to say like, oh, I'm ready now because you're kind of forced into it. You're either gonna crack on or you're not gonna crack on, and you're just gonna do bits. But I, I, I really do think that it's just, it's just everything really to me. Like even if I didn't want to fight, I'd still be looking to roll get on some competitions or I'm always, I'm always looking for the next step, if you know what I mean. So I'm never complacent. It's very rare that you'll ever catch me sat watching telly or playing Xbox. But when I do do it, I appreciate it and I love it. It's like, oh, wow, this is relaxing. Next day, work, training. And I, I like that. It's a very healthy habit to build to learn how to rest properly. Like whether Definitely. it's just not, because if you're absolutely fried thinking, okay, everyone's getting better, everyone's beating me now. However, you're fatigued, you're injured, you're tired. And no wonder you're coming in at maybe 40% and they're coming in at near enough 100. And you're yeah. just dying. Saying, no, maybe just have a rest and not get upset about other people, you know, getting after it when you're not. And this oh, is, exactly. Tell you what, this becomes a bit of a, a counterintuitive side of just general, I don't know, the MMA martial art mindset and stuff. The fact that if you're not training, you're not getting after it. You're not this, you're, you know, you're everything you claim to be against. No, I think, no, just have a fucking day off, mate. Just have a light. Yeah, literally. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not scared to say, you know what? I'm tired. I'm going to have a day off. But also like, not, not obviously blowing my own horn or anything, but it's rare that I do that because my routine is so strict, so balanced and so in order that I never really do have them days where I fatigue too much, where I feel like I can't physically do it. Some days I'll do a slower 10K and other days I'll do a personal best. But the recovery and my training routine in general is very balanced out so that it incorporates the easier training. And then like tonight where I'm going to do strength, fitness and then bag intervals and then an hour of yoga. So I'm going to be at it three, four hours tonight. But then tomorrow I'm just going to do a little bit. So it's about that balance. Definitely. And this is the thing when you stick to the routine. So for everyone listening as well, looking to get stuck in once things are open up again. Building a structure and keeping that structure is what's going to keep the structure. And I said that very deliberately because it's all well and good saying, okay, I'm going to train every single day, push myself as hard as I can. Because then you flat and I think, okay, now what? Now I just feel gassed and feel tired and feel shit. Yeah. Or oh, it's, it's a very important thing to make that mistake first, to know your limits off the bat. I think, okay, if I do yeah. all these days back to back, this is how it's going to make me feel. Because you get people doing the other side of it where they're resting too much, not doing enough, thinking, okay, I'm just coasting like a... I don't know, <laughs> they're not doing enough. And it's, you find your, you calibrate yourself a little bit. So you find out how much I can take in regards information wise, how much I can take in like endurance and all this sort of stuff. You sort of, you find out where you need to rest. You find out why you need to rest. You sweat your diet and all those sort of things. Like for example, nutrition wise, myself is probably similar to yourself where it's my food is fuel. Yeah, definitely <laughs> that's all it is definitely not happy it's not nice but it gets the job done it keeps me keeps me going. exactly that's it i just get it down if it's got the nutrients i'm happy i don't i don't have a favorite food i don't dislike any food as long as it's gonna make me good make my body work in the best way possible i'm good i'll eat it <laughs> like it or not <laughs> that's off the balance itself now that's a point in it that's a very important point post training snacks go on so again you you got in x amount of rounds you're fucking knackered what's in the cupboards what are you going for Straight away is just straight away protein shake because, like, again, that's part of my routine. It's got to be after training, so that yeah. always perks me up. But general food, just like the usual, like banana or a mango, something refreshing, not too carby, something refreshing, and I'll have the carbs and uh, everything else later on. Oh, very good answer. Very good answer. Very professional answer, actually. That's what I mean. I think <laughs> that's the answer people should be given, not you know gummy bears and shit like that. But you know, the Chocolate heart bar. ones, what the heart ones. <laughs> Literally, the heart ones, what the heart ones. It's one of those ones. And with um, the yoga side, do you do much of the meditation bits and bobs with that? Do you try to switch off entirely? Is it more just the actual stretches as they are? What, what does yoga look like for you? Again, it's, you're gonna, it might sound really daft, but yoga is it's more of a, as much as it's a recovery and it's good for your body, it's more of a spiritual thing, to be honest. And it's, it's, I don't know if you know Wim Hof. Mm, the breathing sort of malarkey. The, legend, the ice bath. The one. The one. <laughs> I kind of, I've kind of started taking his method on board, to be honest, with the breathing technique, the ice baths, and the meditation and yoga all in one. In like, a, just in like a general week, I can try and get it all in, and that is like perfect for me because the yoga side of it, I just sit down. I usually do a video because I find it better to follow someone. I just find it easier. Like it's like you ain't got to think too much. You can really zone out and just listen. And I just get in the moment. I just get in with it, and after I just feel amazing. I feel like 
feel like I've slept for eight, nine hours. I just feel completely new. I mean, this is where yoga gets so important because, again, there's... For anyone who hasn't done yoga, it's a very strange thing because initially you think, okay, it's going to be a bit wishy-washy. We all hold hands and you know, call each other like these fancy <laughs> names. No, it's just horrible stretching, which is just... It's, it's harder than it looks, man. Like... People it's, think, oh yeah, I bet that's relaxing. Like you wish, I wish. No, it was. <laughs> no it's not. It's not nice. Like I no, tell you what, no. energy is. It's like you know how a plank feels like forever. It's like that, but a whole session of different movements like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I could have said it better, to be honest. But the thing is, if you find that a good instructor who you sort of on the same sort of level with for certain things, not physically, but like you know mentally, the way they want to sort of coach you, you can get a nice guided version of it. So one of the guys I yeah. listened to, I think it's Flow and Breathe or is. And the way he sort of explains it is like this is like pushing through certain things because again you'll find the similar wordings like you're hearing like jujitsu and the David Goggins shit about you know push through things you're not as tired as you think you are and after the fact you're like okay yeah. you did it I'm like yeah I did it I feel, I feel hard as nails yeah. now well bendy as nails <laughs> real good <laughs> so with all this in itself what is the next step of your journey next sort of thing so obviously we can say bigger picture we'll go into that in a bit but more what is your plan regards the next fight next jiu-jitsu competition what's the next thing for you to compete at in that sense to be, to be quite honest um it's a bit gutting for me because pre-lockdown just before march well just in march i had a tournament booked it was through my gym they started their own fight promotion called berserker and uh of people from different gyms everyone does it people from the gym it's it's like a nice one really it's like a nice easy one and that was a four-man tournament uh for a belt for a welterweight belt and I was honestly I was, I was training like crazy up to that and like a week two weeks before COVID really struck and it got cancelled and I've just carried that same energy right to now so I'm just looking now to just get fights I've been looking through last lockdown I was messaging promoters speaking to my coach it wasn't really feasible at the time because the world's up in a mess so there's not really much room there's not much room to be like oh I can't believe I can't get that fight because the world's in a mess so I, I just allow it but my next thing is, I just want to get on the scene and just smash it. Because I've only had two charity fights, actually. That's, that's, that's all I've done. I've had two charity fights, again, through my gym. And, I, and since then, I've just been smashing it. And all I want is just to get on the scene. And just people people just to see, like, what all this work, that's what it's for. Because I just want to be the best I can. And I just love the sport. Like, that's what I want. I just want to compete. I want to get a fight in next. So it'll be my amateur debut, technically. I just want to get a fight in next and just... Prove to myself and other people that all this headache, really, like not seeing my friends, not partying, running every Sunday, first thing in the morning, like it's all worth it because I put on the show and that's what I'm here for. I mean, there's so much more than just the sort of superficial, I've had a fight, this is it, no, it's everything. And again, like that's what I mean. That sort of blue balls feeling, like again, like you're ready to go for like March last year. Now it's like, okay, Frothing, it's like give me something, please. Let me bang, bro. Oh. Let me bang, bro. Listen to it. <laughs> Let me bang, bro. <laughs> Let me bang, bro. Uh, that's kind of the energy. Like, with the charity fights, and how can we do those? Was that more platform? Was it specific charities close to you? What is the actual? How come that came about? Well, to be honest, it was about I think it was 2017. I'm not too good with dates. Not all about it. But granddad had got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease like, a year before, and. I, would ju- I was going to do an ultra MMA. I don't know if you've seen it, ultra. Yeah, yeah. I was going to do that and it was in Sheffield. I didn't have a car. I was just like, just left school. I was a bit like, didn't know what I wanted in life. Bit naughty, not really. No no direction, bit naughty, in and out of jobs. Met, messed up school, everything. And I was going to do that charity fight. And, and one of my family friends says, why, why, why don't you do the one for our gym? Which was Tap or Snap at the time. It's just changed names now, it's Resurrection. So why don't you do it for our gym? Because it's for Parkinson's disease. Like That's the charity. Mm. Because I coached mum has actually got it. Parkinson's so obviously it's, it's close to his heart so the whole thing really was for Parkinson's and I thought yeah that's perfect I did the fight and I just thought wow like this is me like I want it did another one for Parkinson's again and like I'm here now so really it really it was for my granddad to be honest it was just a nice thing to keep me active I never thought I'd be in this position now where I'm saying right this is what my life revolves around and this is how I want to feed my family when, in the future so, I mean, the stars just align for that, really. That's such a perfect sort of situation. But regards to the competition side, how did the farm, How did you feel when push came to shove? So wanting to fight now when you're feeling fit, feeling fresh, feeling excited is wonderful. Like right now, I could fight everyone and it'd be amazing. I would never gas and, yeah. and so on and so forth. But when you're in the changing room, <laughs> when you get your hands around, 
what was that energy like? How did that compare to expectation? How did the, I don't know, the, the padded slap in the face hit you? How did you find it? Well, I've always, I'm, 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 I'm a confident person. I'm very strong-minded. I don't, I, there's, not, there's not much what can be said or done to get me down. I've done like breakdancing competitions. I did cadets. So I'm used to crowds. I'm used to a bit of the attention on me. My mum had a dance company in the village that I live in and I danced for years, did shows and stuff. So that side of it was fine. The thing for me, what was like, oh, this is actually happening, is when I was actually in there, stood there and the ref's like, in this corner, we've got Jordan Allen. It is a chef from Tuckton. I was like, oh, right. Oh, oh like, shit. <laughs> this is happening. Like, wow. Like, I'm not just talking about it to my mates saying I'm going to have a fight like, I'm about to get punched. And I'm going to punch someone up. Like this is this is mad. <laughs> How did the fights go? Because again, the rules are quite weird. Because there's no head kicks, there's no ground and pound. I think you can ground and pound the body, but I'm not sure. There's no leg locks of any shape, way, shape, or form. It's a weird one. Like, what sort of game plan did you have going into those? Well, the first one, I was a bit I, I, at the time. I was a bit. It was no head shots for me because I just turned 18, and the youngest lad in the gym was that. Like, I think he was just turned 17, and no one else could fight him because they're all older, 20, mid 20s, 30s. Mm-hmm. So I kind of got the short straw to say, like, you're going to have to fight him, no headshots. And I've been training for headshots. And, like, last two weeks, I got told, I thought, God, like, a few of my mates, like, oh, you're not even punching your head, like, I can't believe that. Ooh. And it was a bit, like, kicking the teeth, really. But then I did it, and that was the best thing I ever did because it gave me the right introduction to it, if you know what I mean. So that one there, the rules were, it, it was actually better because the first ever fight you've got and you can't put someone in the head, and that's what you've been training for. So it actually made me learn that rules are there to be followed by. And if I had a punch him in the face, I caught him once or twice by a complete accident, which is going to happen, obviously, and he caught me. But it just taught me that these rules are there for a reason. My second fight was headshots, and I, they, I finished it by TKO, and it was I, it was headshots, ground and pound. Head kicks were allowed. The, rule, the rules were all there. I think I think it was just elbows and knees, to be honest. Don't hold me on that, but I think it was just no elbows and no... I think it was just amateur, amateur with, shin yeah. guards, with shin guards, yeah. So that, that one already was a step up for me, and then... Fine, loved it really. I did. Do you cut much weight for those sort of things? So, how much you walk around at now? Right now, I'm at 83. I was a fight at welterweight, so it's 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 mine really. It's like cover. I could do it in two weeks. For I mean, it's very easy. Back then, I was a lot skinny. I didn't have much of a build, so that was my weight really. Like that, that I was. But I think I think I might have to put weight on. I'm not sure, but uh, I think I might have been just there for my second fight but right now I'm, I'm happy really because again with my routine diet and things I've kept steady at 83, 84 and I like to fight at welterweight for amateur I probably go lightweight at pro I'm not sure I'm going to see how it goes because I don't like the idea of cutting too much weight so like, I'd like to stay at this weight really I mean I don't, like, I don't like the idea of it really funny thing is you say by 83 and you're going down to 77 like I'll make you one now and I'm fighting 66 and you're see, it's crazy <laughs> It's, it's, it's one of them ones like yeah, fuck, fuck fighting welterweight man it's one of them ones fuck that noise I've seen some big boys fighting a welterweight and it scares the life out of me <laughs> yeah, I know like, that, that's the thing like like now nah, like, I'm, I'm training for that fourth dimension MMA as well yeah yeah, yeah. Um, big boys there man big boys <laughs> bro <laughs> uh, I, 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 I've been in their pro bubble for like the last few weeks with that with the COVID test and everything I've been training up there and I speak to a few of the welterweights there and I've kind of like come home you know, after a bath, looked in the mirror and thought, that's not a welterweight frame at that level. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, mm, I can't, that's why I say I'll probably go pro at lightweight because end of the day, it's like, I don't want to cut too much weight, but there's guys out there cutting serious weight. I don't want to jeopardise my future, my health. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, I'm probably better off walking around at 80 and fighting at lightweight and just taking, still a big-ish cut, but taking that little cut, if you know what I mean. Because a bit like welterweight, I've always thought, yeah, welterweight, welterweight. And like, now you say, you take a step back, look at people think, that's why people cut weight. <laughs> well, a lot of his application, and again, because you get different sort of frames, different sort of builds. So you get the short, stocky guys who can cut loads of water like it's nothing. Whereas there's a guy who I train with, Alex Elsie. He's, um, he's a welterweight. He's a similar build to me. But the thing is, he uses his frame really well. He applies it well for welterweight. So although he's going to cut on much like self, like five or six kilos, <laughs> it's a much more manageable, much more efficient kind of cut. Whereas if I... If I, don't, if I don't take it too seriously, I mean, at Featherweight, it's not a very nice thing. Um, yeah. Very, very, very skinny individual. I'm not very happy with it. Yeah. Yeah, so it gets done. But this is the tricky thing. This is part of amateur. So obviously, building your career, building your experience as well, it makes no real sense for you to make all this disgusting cut 
purely just for the cut being the main focus? Because at that point, what's the fight yeah. camp? What's the preparation? Exactly. That, that's that's what I think sometimes. I'll tell you who's good around um Nottinghamerism, Dean Kirk, shout out, we'll plug there. Yeah, yeah, Richard. yeah. That, that that is that yeah, honestly, next next fight, I've already I've already got it in mind. I've already got it there waiting, ready. Yeah, shameless plug for everyone there. Dean Kirk Nutrition's your man. Anyway, cutting needs, give him a give him a shout out. No fist to come sent you as well. But yeah, let's get that in there. I think um fourth dimension. Do you watch them um, Spar Wars from Cyan Boxing? Mate, I, I watch it be I watch it being filmed and I'm just like I, I love it, man, honestly. Like the, the levels there, man. Like for someone like me who's not even had his amateur debut, like to be even able to be in the mix with them guys and stay on my two feet, it gives me a, not gives me a slight confidence to say like I'm I'm not terrible. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I, I can I can I can hold my weight to a degree. I still get smashed up. I'm not standing there to say like I'm I'm ta- I've never tapped anyone. I, I rarely even hit people very clean. You know what I mean? But just to be able to be in the mix of them guys and be around it, it it's levels. You know what I mean? Like serious levels and that's Cyan boxing. That's it's amazing, man. Like the man who does it is such a nice bloke. Like, mm, and even works. even just for the fighters, like there's not much, there's not much support or there's a platform on social media. But as a fighter, you're on your own. Like you are you. Like you need you need to finance yourself, manage yourself. Obviously, you get them people in future. But you are you, and them platforms like that is changing the fight game because it's giving people the a voice. People are watching. I like him. Follow him, and then you've got a fan for life because of seeing you on that. And that, that is a, for me, it's an amazing thing. And I, th- I think more people should sort of do that. Get 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 on it. Get yourself out there. Do you know what I mean? Like send messages. Like don't be shy to just ask questions. And worst anyone's going to say is no. You know what I mean? And that's it. When you ask, ask with respect, because what you see a lot of people doing is ask for freebies in this in this game. Because as much as like you know, everyone respects all the fighters. You respect all the competitors. You watch. I tell you now, anyone listening that will appreciate this. If you've got a business, you will find. X amount of people saying I want to get sponsored by you. Give me all free shit. I'm a blue belt. Yeah. I'm hard as nails. Give me all your like fight worth. And, no, fuck off. Hello, gentlemen, sir. Yeah. Do you want um fight manufacturer clothes or something? And all the words all the wrong way around. They get plethora of that shit. But yeah, things like Cyan Box and things like these promotion pages. I can't urge any more for people just to share this stuff because again, yeah. if that grows, everything grows. And giving these people a platform like yourself, because again. They see Amari le- le- leathering the shit out of everyone, and then, you, then there's you surviving, doing quite well. I think, okay, who's this boy? <laughs> and then we sort of, you know, and there we are. <laughs> you got yourself a fan, you got yourself a bit of respect, and again, you got yourself a bit more exposure. Because again, outside of like grainy phone footage, with old school sort of <laughs> stuff, now we have an era of self promotion. We get social media, we get algorithms. Yeah. As much as it's meant to be purely fight focused, you know, you've got to promote yourself, you've got to build yourself. Otherwise, where are you going to go? You can win exactly. your fights, but you'll be the guy with 14 and 0 without any title shots because no one can no one wants to buy any tickets. <laughs> yeah, no one's bothered. That's the thing. It is I've always said it like I made a I made a separate page just for my MMA stuff. I've got a personal. I don't use it. I'm gonna delete it eventually. Like I should have just converted that one, if you know what I mean. But mm. I made an MMA page purely for that reason because I, I've watched a lot of fight documentaries. I watch I, I like to watch some things on YouTube, the UFC embedded and stuff. And I just came one day to a realization to say. No one, no one's going to know who you are unless you do spectacular things. Does that make sense? Mm. So you've got to raise your profile yourself. And if, if that's just documenting your training on like vlogging it and blogging it through your stories and your Instagram and stuff, people will notice. And if it takes time and you build slowly, that's all that matters. But the fact that you're out there and doing it, like to me, it's a big thing because you, you are a business. Like you've got to promote yourself. You've got to get yourself out there. And like you say, there's people in various promotions who get title shots who don't really deserve them just because of the popularity. And the sport is entertainment before it's a sport. Like that, that, I think that as well. Like well, I do it as a passion for the sport, but when I'm in that cage, I need to entertain. I need to make people think, wow, he, he, he's cool, man. I like it. I'm going to watch him again. And that, that's, that's what it's all about for me. Again, it's a business as well, because as much as the promoters make like you as a person, they might see, oh, he's sound. I've seen him working. Yeah, but... If you've not sold any tickets and they've given up your slot for someone else who could have, you know, sold a bit more and, you know, done a bit, that's money that's not in their pockets for a very, like, razor thin margin show anyway. So, exactly. And that's the problem. You, you, you end of the day, it's not, you, you've got to be worth watching to a degree. Because, you like, like I say, mm. charity fighters are selling 30 tickets at a time to all my family and friends. But if your family and friends are going to support you and be there for you all the way. You need, more, you know what I mean? You always want more. And that, that's human nature, not even on a fighting level. Like everyone wants more. You always want more. You can never get complacent. And especially with this sport, 
you cannot. You, you've got to always be raising your profile, building, looking for sponsors, looking for people who to who can just level you up that bit more and help you and help each other because you've you've got to us. You just end up at a plateau. You'll do your amateur career, about to go pro, and no one wants to give you a contract or a fight because who are you? You know what I mean? Well, definitely. And this is it's always a bit of a management thing. It's a bit of an understanding and experience. And this is something that's a bit of a learning process and something to really emphasize. Get good first, then worry about telling people about it. Because you'll see a lot of people, and I've been caught in it myself. You get caught with other pros doing bits and bobs, and then there's a little amateur me coming along saying, Look at me training as well, thinking, Yeah, there is a balance. But if you're hitting pads, you're fucking shit. Like, not, like, you know, I'm not fantastic. I have seen my pads throughout the years and watched them back. At the time, I think I'm, I don't know who I think I am. But watching them back, I think I'm not who I thought I was. So just be a bit mindful when you're promoting everything, when you're still building. And again, it's it's not the end of the world. It's all a learning process. And this is sort of the point. If you're not slightly embarrassed about who you used to be, you're not progressing enough. But exactly. it's, it's always a, a balance between that ego and that development to understanding where you are and that humility. And it's a very tricky one. It's a very honest one you have to It's have. difficult. Yeah, yeah. It's Definitely. difficult. It's difficult even on a personal level because, me, like I said before, me personally, I'm very confident. So like, I'm, I, I don't care what people. I could put a photo on, get a hundred comments, and they're all just ripping me, and I would still put another photo on the next day because that's what I want to do. I do not care what anyone says. If it, if it's negative, especially positive stuff, I'll take it on board. Negative stuff, I'll take it on board, but it never will affect me. And that's what people overlook is that for some people, one word can change their entire outlook on life, and they might think, oh. I'm not like someone's like, oh, you're, you're not that good at pads, you mate. Like, I've watched you, like, them kicks are shit. Like, me, I say, oh, whatever, mate. Like, yeah, man, so I'll see you later. But some people might be like, oh, right, like, um, yeah, I'm pretty shit, mate. I'm going to take a step back and let like, the other big boys play. And like, you've just got to be confident in yourself and your abilities at the time. Like, me, like, even from now to the start of lockdown, me and my stepdad, Luigi, he, he did, he joined, I'm not going to mind me saying this, he joined the Kickboxing Academy. Shout out there because it's a nice gym, it's a good gym, Shallow big gym everywhere. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know you've been down there recently. There's serious guys there. He joined the Chesterfield one two days before the lockdown, but all the equipment really got into it and then lockdown. And we've not stopped training for a year. And I watch videos of me and him at the start, and me and him now, and I almost get a bit emotional to say like, have we really improved that drastically from that just in our living room and our back garden? And like, it's good. It's good to say like, wow. Like, I thought I was, I thought I was all right then as well. You know what I mean? Like you say like. Wow, reality check, like, and even when I look now, I think that's not what I want. That's not where I want to be. And it's a journey of self evaluation. Because if you look at if every time you take a video, you say, "Wow, that's meant that I'm sick." It, you know, you know that you're to yourself because <laughs> you, you're not, are you? <laughs> and that's it. But again, what you've highlighted there is so powerful. But also, the way you can handle that is even better. The fact is, think it's not. Oh shit, I'm shit now. I think about how good I'm gonna be. Like, think exactly. about what I'm doing now. Think about how sick I'm going to be in X amount of time. Exactly. I just think from now to next year, last March to this March, improvement without without proper coaching and proper gym. Imagine what it'd be like with all that. And that's how you've got to be. You've got to look at the negative, turn them into positives, and then influence your journey from there. Definitely. 100%. And that's in for club like to end things on. So social media, my friend, where can people find you? Uh, Jordan Coco MMA on Instagram. And same on Facebook, really. That's, that's the main one. Absolutely perfect. Um, shout out to yourself, shout out to the guys of Resurrection, and shout out to our sponsors, English Hypnotist. So anyone who wants to take their step further in um, the mental side of their business, their fighting, anything like that, to really understand how things are working, understand yourself. And it's a really interesting conversation to have with um, Richard Hart, top boy. Um, Pisticuffs underscore podcast for all social media. And fresh cards will be arriving next week. So stay tuned, stay posted. Mm-hmm.